you watch the film, for example, and it's just a two-hour action scene. You, you don't appreciate the action scene, you know? And you need to have a story to... Did you just say you don't like Transformers? I love Transformers. Oh, <laughs> Michael, sorry, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> Hey Jenna, so good to have you here. Thank you. Thank How you, are you? you? I'm good. Yeah, arm's a bit sore, but it's worth the pain. Cool. How's the dog? Good. Good. I'm, you did a really good job. I'm really happy with it. Yeah, cool. She looks. She looks like a like a cartoon superhero. <laughs> <laughs> Glad you like it. So yeah. tell us, Jenna, who is Cressida? Cressida. Um, <coughs> so I could start off where I got the name because everyone seems. To yeah, yeah, yeah please. So I used to work in like a vintage clothes shop in London. And there used to be like an old woman who used to come in and we used to speak about, she's like a classically trained pianist. And like one of my jobs was to get people's email addresses and their names and her name was Cressida. And I was like, that's a really cool name actually. And we became really good friends as well. She was like 80 years old or whatever. And we yeah. just had a lot, lot in common, weirdly. And then I was like, I'm going to steal her name. She would never find out. There you go. I didn't cool. tell her. Thanks yeah. so much. When was that? This is like 2000... 13, 2012, something like this. Yeah, okay, okay. okay. Ten, oh, yeah, it's 10 years. Jeez, yeah. time flies, yeah? Time definitely flies. Cool. So you're from London. How is it there? Cold. Cold. Amazing food. Yeah? Contrary to what people think. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's good, but I miss it. But when I go back, I realise that I, I like Berlin. Yeah. Everyone seems to be in a rush in London, you know? How is the scene there? It's fucking good. Yeah. I do, what I do miss is the, you know, you can accidentally go to a night, which is what I did as a kid, you know, like you go, you don't even look who's playing, but you know the music's going to be good. Okay, you know? okay. And there was a bigger mixture of genres. So there'd be like drum and bass, dubstep, garage, house, techno, everything. And people, people weren't so uh, confined to one genre as a mm. DJ or as a person partying, you know. Sick. So you go... And you listen to a DJ you've never heard of, and then you get obsessed with them, and then, yeah. But the problem with London is, like, a lot of places are closing down now. Plastic People, Dance Tunnel, these were two of my favourite clubs, which I owe a lot of my musical sort of upbringing to, mm -hmm. to these clubs, you know? Why? What happened? Like, what's happening right now? I don't know. Like, I think it's just being bought out. I'm not sure. Like, yeah. people just seem to be buying up spaces. Um, I guess the government's trying to push it to rich people and build housing and stuff and as opposed Jeez. to nurturing culture. You know? So it's the same kind of vibe that we have in Berlin right now, the whole Yeah, but the process here seems to be slower and people are less accepting here. Yeah, it's a cultural thing here. Yeah, because like it's in the DNA of the, of, of, the, of the capital, you know, the clubbing scene. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whereas in London, I feel like the people who club, they club, but then the people grow out and people stop, you know? But here I feel like everyone has an element of going out in them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like yeah. connection to the scene, you know? Yeah, mean? yeah, yeah. And you can have long-lasting friendships from the scene, you know? And yeah, but it's it's interesting what you say, because, like, from all the information, like, all the different genres, mm -hmm. like, that you don't have, like, that many, like, well, London is much bigger than Berlin, mm -hmm. uh, you, that you don't have, like, all these uh, connections between the people, like, that not everyone has a... Has a connection to the clubs the club scene you know what I mean yeah well, London's a lot bigger you know like so in London I knew so many people but like I would never bump into them accidentally here I could be in Vedding going to a spatie at five in the morning you bump into someone sure. <laughs> yeah, okay. so it feels smaller you know and yeah. you always see someone you know or like whichever party you go to you see you, you will notice a familiar face yeah in London you could be at the same party with your friends and you probably wouldn't see them because it's so like everything seems to be big there you know? okay Yeah. Are the venues bigger? Huh? Are the venues? It's not even the venue, it's just, yeah. Like, the venues seem to be a bit bigger, but, like, in terms of, like, the city itself, you you don't run into people, you know? Mm. So how was it to make, to find your people here, like, to find friends, like, to how, why, when did you move here to start with? Like, how uh, did it expand? It was, I remember the date, actually, it's July 15th, um, 2015. Mm. And, yeah, I moved over, like, everyone else, you know, for the music scene, making music, whatever, you want to connect. And, like, when you lived in London, there was this sort of uh, romanticism about Berlin. Like, if you want to be a producer, you go to Berlin. All my favourite DJs moved from London to Berlin. 
So it seemed like a natural transition for me. Mm -hmm. And a lot of my, and I was just sick of the London prices, you know, like paying 700 pounds for a box with a toilet in the corner. You know, like, mm -hmm. And here for the same price, I can get a whole fucking apartment. You know? mm. So yeah. Back in the days. Back in the day, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, but Berlin's getting more expensive. But when I go back to London, I'm like, okay, Berlin's fine. Yeah, 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 yeah for course, You know, of like course. even small things which help the clubbing industries, like, you know, 24 hour trains. Yeah. Like if you don't want to take a taxi, you don't need to take a taxi here. Whereas in London, if you don't want to take a taxi, you've got a fucking five hour walk, you know? <laughs> like, Jesus. Yeah, or you're like, yeah, you, you've spent like a hundred pounds before you've even gone to the club kind of thing, you know? Yeah. Like taxis, entrance, all this stuff. And then when you get into the clubs, you spend even more. And it's like, you'd have to work five jobs or be very rich to enjoy the clubbing scene. Okay, okay. I feel like clubbing shouldn't be just for the rich, you know? Even though that's what they're trying to push it to become, you know? Hmm. How do you explain this phenomenon? What do you mean? Sorry. How do you explain this? I don't know. Like, well, in London, what I love and I hate about Berlin is that they don't take card. You know? <laughs> <laughs> the next day, I love it, but the day on the day, I, sure. I hate it, you know? But in London, you'd be like, can I get a drink for five people? And that's like 50 euros or 50, like even more, 70 somewhere. Like, been to clubs where they said they don't serve singles, only doubles, and a single was 12 pounds, you know? <laughs> like, And when you've got a card, it's just, you're fine on Dangerous. payday. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But um, yeah, like you, ca you can't afford to physically go out every single week, you know? Yeah, that, that's something we slowly observe here as well. I'm yeah. going to see like over, like I moved to Berlin like one year. Yeah, no, a actually two, three months after you, like two months after you. Okay, yeah. And um, yeah, we see the difference between the, the price of the entrances. It's crazy. Or the fees or yeah. the, even the train ticket, man. Mm-hmm. It's crazy how it's everything increased. Yeah. But the thing is, it's still not as rapid as... Like, I, I, I'm feeling it. Yeah. Like like I said, like cucumbers are two, two euros now. <laughs> you know? But like, as a whole, I can get by comfortably for not... Uh, like, I would have to earn twice as much to live this comfortably in London. You know? mm. But yeah. I, but whilst I'm in Berlin, I still miss my friends and the food and stuff like this. But I couldn't see myself moving back. But when I did go out in London, because I played in Fabric in December, and I know what I do notice is that I can get away with playing different music there. And people are more accepting of break beats and stuff, which is in my DNA to play, sure. you know? But, yeah, so w when I go back, I do miss this element of it, but the Berlin scene is also amazing for different reasons, you know? It evolved a lot in the past years. Berlin? It evolved a lot yeah, in the past sure. years. Yeah, for sure, yeah, yeah. So you still have a lot of connections to uh, to London? Yeah. I mean, I'm always going to do this. I'm always okay. going to have it. Because I've had friends who lived in Berlin who've moved back to London now. And uh, it's always going to have a place in my heart. Mm -hmm. But just not in my wallet. So who are you nowadays? Well, so I, work, like I'm, I was currently working, but now I'm not working anymore. So I'm trying to work out what I really want to do. You know, and I've been spending a lot of time making music recently. A couple of years ago, I started learning piano mm. in my spare time because I felt like when I'm making electronic music, I don't like melodies, but I love melodies when it comes to acoustic instruments like pianos and stuff like this. So I, I have a love for both, but just not together, you know? So I'm currently working on an album and I'm, there's not going to be any kick drums anywhere. Mm. It's going to be completely ambient slash classical Interesting. music. Yeah. So you don't completely mix both worlds? No, not for me. Like, it's like I like pineapples and I like pizzas. I just don't like them together, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Yeah, like each serves its purpose, but I, for me, yeah, when they're sense. together, it just ruins both of them for me. All right. That's just personal taste. Anyway. Yeah, sure. Yeah, but I've been speaking to a lot of people. It's like, what do you prefer, loopy stuff or melodic stuff? And for me, it's always loopy. Yeah. When it comes to techno, for example. So when I'm mixing, I like to tell my own story via having you know, three, four different loops and I can take it in my own direction mm -hmm. as opposed to leaving a song do its own thing. And if I don't want it to go that, that direction, I have to keep it, I have to let it do it, you know? Go cool, yeah. That's why I keep it loopy. Yeah, great. So yeah. That, that's the, uh, on the menu for your next uh, musical productions. Yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah, I mean, when I'm making techno, like I try to keep it minimal. Mm hmm which is why I like mixing it because then you, you have your own, 
you know, like you have your ingredients and you can make something bigger. Whereas if all the ingredients are combined, it's hard to make your own story. Basically, mm-hmm. that's that's the personal like thing. And what inspires you? I don't know. Like or who? Films, walks, animals, yeah. books. They all inspire me, and music, of course. Like, but what I try not to do is be inspired by music that I'm making. I I prefer to like. If I'm talking about arrangements or melodic, I know I said I don't like melodic stuff, but like it, whatever I'm making, it needs to have some sort of melodic content somehow, even if I don't want it to be. But like, you know, even breaking down EDM tracks or something like this, mm. applying that to techno, it doesn't have to be as cheesy as EDM or like obnoxious as EDM. You can take some traits from there and apply it to music. To the music you're making. You know? Do you have an example, like any artist that you... Dead Mouse. Like I, I have like a folder where like I broke down a lot of stuff. And um, whether you like it or not, these these productions are immaculately made, you know. Mm-hmm. And there's a reason why there's a lot of people that like it. And the more I research music, the more I feel lost in a good way. Oh, yeah. It's just it's like in, uh, in wisdom in general. Like the more yeah. you know, the more you realize you don't know shit. Exactly. Exactly. And like the way that the human brain works in general is like, I was thinking like, why is it that I can go to some baby who's never listened to music and I can play drums and it knows how to dance, you know? So Absolutely. it has all this like primal instincts, instincts yeah. and stuff. Yeah. But I, I don't know if it's mathematics, science or something bigger. It's a feeling. It's just a feeling, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. But yeah, like trying to work out and like, because as humans, you like to categorize stuff and break stuff down to a- atomic components and stuff like this. It's like, why? I need to know why this is good. I need to know why this makes me do this. But you don't know. Like, why does this smell make me feel happy? You know, like, why does this color make me feel warm? It's like, you can't really explain it. You know, and there are it mathematical does, mm. theories as to why frequencies make us feel good. You know? mm. But it still doesn't exp- like explain the feeling you have. Not yet. Not yet. Not yeah. Yet. How do you produce? What's what are your secrets? I mean, there's no such thing as secrets now that YouTube's around because everyone knows everyone's secrets. But like, yeah. what resonates with me is like everyone's brains work in different ways. Some people can go in, you know, and make a song from nothing. Some people like to plan everything. Mm. Uh, the way I do it, it's like I like to break stuff down into compartments. Mm-hmm. Um, of course. I would start off by jamming. That's how I start. So I, so most of the time I have no fucking idea what's going to happen. And I know what genre, 67% of the time, but the rest I might start at 100 BPM, finish 170, finish 140, finish 120. I never know what's going to mm. happen. And it depends on the quality of the jam. And sometimes I'm just not inspired, you know. I'm trying to make some sounds and it's not really working. I get uninspired by that. Do you work on your own? Hmm? Do you work on your own? Yeah. So okay. Yeah. I mean, I've worked with other people and I enjoy doing that. There's mm-hmm. a few pe- like I've worked with some people where it just does not work because yeah. I everyone is kind of sure-footed when they're making music. They're like, I know what's happening. I know what to do. I know what to do. And regardless of your experience, everyone has something to offer. I believe. Of course. Like, even if you've been making music for ten minutes, you have something to offer someone who's been making music for I don't know ten years, kind of thing. So it's it's good to find the balance between like listening and also asserting your I don't know flow onto people not onto people but like you have to find a middle ground and I've worked with some people where we sit down and we just make a fucking tune in seconds you know and what works for you I don't know I just like when people give you room to like a lot of music in terms of electronic music is trial and error I I don't believe that anyone goes into making techno and knows the sequence they're going to do because of musical f- knowledge from before. You you have to fuck around to mm. find out, you know? And when I work with some people, like, you... I don't know, like, you don't have time to do that because people are like, no, I need to have results now. Let's do this, let's do this, let's do this. As opposed to the beauty of this industry is that, or the music-making process is you have to make happy accidents. You know? mm-hmm. And some people aren't, uh, have, don't have patience for that. 
or they ex- expect some gold to come straight away. And I don't think that anyone can just walk in and make gold. Yeah, it's a big thing, like in uh, any creative industry. You now it's like for the newcomers, or maybe even for the, the, the other generations, like yeah. people that are longer in the scene than yours, to, to get to that point where even if you worked hard every day and you practice and you practice and you practice, success might never really come. Mm-hmm. But for the people, it's like immediately. Yeah. Or it's like of social media, it's like they pop up and like yeah. they, they get instantly famous mm-hmm. just because of whatever, maybe one track or like one drawing or one tattoo in our industry, yeah. whatever. Like it's super interesting to, to observe that. Yeah. I mean, I've seen a lot of people who just blow up suddenly because of, I wouldn't say luck because what they made is good, you know, mm. but being a good musician for me is consistency. And evolution and wanting to grow and not just stagnate in you know like if you listen to a, like your favorite rapper or whatever if they made 100 albums all the same you would you would get bored sure even if the first one was amazing you still have to make variants and you know iterations on that you can't get stuck in this do you consider music as your hobby or more as a kind of job w- or a second job i would never ever want it to be a second job i never want to be reliant on music for money. The m- money is good Income. Okay. because that's. I feel like that's when the integrity and uh, the quality goes down for, for, for me, let's say. Like, I don't know, like all of my, f- not all of my favourite artists, but a lot of my favourite artists from back in the day, they, I don't want to say sold out, but like the, the quality goes down and then you have to rely on Instagram. You have to rely on likes. You have to rely on outs, out external I don't know, external stimulus to make the music, you know, like, oh, I want to make this music, but my, uh, but I won't get gigs. But Interesting. I, I want to make music because I'm making music. And if I get mm-hmm. a gig because of that, that's good. I don't want it to ever interfere with like, I've got some friends who are like, I, I, you have to, you have to make different music to make, to get gigs and stuff. And I don't want to ever be reliant on Undoubt. money to make music, you know? And how does it work so far for you? Good, yeah, good. Like, cause I, I always want to have like a a real job, you know, because then it doesn't affect my music, it doesn't affect the integrity so of the music. So you see a complete uh, impact on your music. Yeah, because I remember during it. Corona when no one had a job, people just were panicking and stuff. And mm-hmm. I had friends who. There's also what you have to learn in well, what I did learn in the electronic music scene is that it's very fickle and ephemeral and stuff moves quickly. I remember when I first started making music, like maybe 10 years ago, in the industrial techno scene was big. Then it was EBM. Then it's electro. Now it's trance. And it's, in a few years, it's going to be something else, you know? What's next? I don't know. I'm thinking, um, what's it called? Electro swing. Yeah? You yeah. think? No, like I'm that. joking. <laughs> was like 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't know what it's going to be, but we're going to find out. And the thing is like, what scares me in a good way I'm in a good way is yeah. that like the people who are making music are so much younger now and when I grew up like having a MacBook you, no one has a MacBook unless you're rich as fuck you know I was making music on like Windows X not XP but like some Windows thing and you have to download these things and like do you remember LimeWire? Yeah, I wanted to mention yeah. that. Of course, <laughs> I forgot about this. I was thinking about this today because <laughs> when I was coming here, I was listening to some like music I did from a kid, and it reminded me of downloading stuff from Lama. Yeah. Yeah, it's a completely different story. But um, yeah, now the accessibility is so easy. Like I can go right. for five hundred euros, I can get a whole studio in my on my on my legs. You know. Yeah. Whereas back then, you need to buy synth, you need to buy this, you need to buy speakers, you need to buy headphones, you need to buy all this stuff and it wasn't just as easy as you can now and Mm -hmm. if you want to learn something you have to fucking do it yourself you have to make error trials and error now if if something doesn't work in a synth i just google it easy you know and back then like if i want music i'd have to go to record store if i want to do this yeah you have to go and do something and spend time and frustration which is also what makes builds character let's say you know but what, what do you think about it? Like, I mean, I can compare it with what we do like in tattooing where we can say like, okay, the older, like old school, they also complain or like they, they say the exact same as you did with yeah. the record shops. You had to invest more time, yeah, energy, yeah. anything easier. Yeah. Machines are also like faster, lighter, more easy to handle. But that's 
progress that's how human behavior is and like totally at the end we're just lazy this is why like in a good way this is why it makes us think further so that we can think more easy because like if we're and children will still <laughs> work <Huh? and laughs> yeah. children will still work and like we would still like uh, be on horses and like yeah, I, I cars, care, which know? is why i said i'm scared in a yeah. good way or surprised in a good way because like i'm glad that all this information yeah. has been easily accessible but that's what creates that gets rid of some elements which I don't like, like for example, quality control. Like I can start a label, I can make, I can download Ableton, I can download samples, I can put put together an arrangement and have a label all in one day, mm -hmm. you know? And I feel like with that easy accessibility, you can make stuff that in the future you would look back and not be proud of. You know, you don't have time to deliberate over stuff and really think, do I want to put this out forever? Because once you release something, it's there forever. But for like some producer, for me included, like I release some stuff and I'm like, maybe I shouldn't have released that. But at the time it sounds good and it's easy to do. So why not do it, you know? But you forget that in the in the age of the internet, when you put stuff out, it's there forever. I just said that. <laughs> like the thing is like, everything goes so fast nowadays. And like, Andy Warhol said, few years ago long time ago in the future everyone's gonna be uh, famous for 15 minutes 15 no, minutes of fame yeah 15 seconds yeah <laughs> no, now not even. yeah, yeah like, not even like you know like it's so crazy how fast things are and i go so w what is it right now w what's important is like i, I totally get you your, your point about uh, the fact of like not going to <coughs> sorry about not um not producing and like putting everything online but on the other side is like this also how you get better how you can get feedback from other people mm -hmm. and like you mentioned it as well like for people like young artists to become very like to get to have a big platform very fast mm -hmm. like i mean nowadays we have 20 years old like having millions of followers and like yeah, yeah. living the life and offering their family a better life just because of that just because they're funny they which is amazing idea, whatever yeah so it has this good side as well of course i love so, the good side of it it's just like I probably sound old here, but like all the mistakes I made as a kid, no one will ever find out. But now everything is online. Yeah. You would never forget this stuff. So I'm so glad we didn't have TikTok as a kid or Instagram because yeah, I would is, hate yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. but now like if the kids like if I could see my parents and they had TikToks in cell twelve, I find that weird for me. Or Instagram, whatever, it's social media. Like now you could like if if I had a kid, they can watch me grow up from like however old I was when I got Instagram, I don't know, 23 until 50 and they can see, document everything. Sure. And show exactly creepy, what it was. You know, like and but that's cool on the other side. But I, no, I think if you take pictures for yourself, it's nice that you put all your life online mm -hmm. may not be the smartest thing, especially right now with all the AI stuff. Yeah, and you like also you grow as a person. Everyone does, you know, like even looking at my stuff I put on Facebook five years ago, I was like cringing so hard, you know, like, <laughs> oh, delete is also a lot of stuff and Facebook is great for telling you to cringe because it brings up old shit I'm like no you mind your business I delete my account <laughs> yeah that's one way to do it yeah jeez so what do you think about all these uh, Instagram TikTok is, are they tools or are we slaves to them to these apps it's what? a bit of both like so I go through phases where like if I've got if I need to push something for my career as a musician yeah. I need to I need to do the Instagram stuff, even if I don't enjoy it or feel comfortable, you need to do it. I haven't got TikTok yet, but um, yeah, you need to push. And I understand why, because you get a reach and that's what that's why people pay millions and billions for advertising. Sure. That's what you're doing is getting free advertising, but you just have to work a little bit for it. A little bit, it's a job. It's like a fucking know, job, you yeah, know? And, there's, and sometimes you could be doing everything right. I'm not talking about myself personally, but like some people... I've seen like putting a lot of effort and nothing really comes off it or like you have to post at a certain time of day, mm -hmm. algorithms, blah, 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 shadow banning, all these buzzwords come up and I'm like, <laughs> I just want to make fucking music, you know? I just want to make music and when you have this element, it becomes an anxiety and mm -hmm. you become c comparative to other artists, you know? Like you're only as good as your Instagram likes. That's not true, you know? Like... But even I Wise get, words. Like sometimes I'll look at an artist who I love and I'm like, why do they not have more Instagram likes? It's like, well, it doesn't matter. The music is good is what matters. Mm -hmm. And it's like sometimes 
I would look them like my favorite artists have got bad reach, but they make the best music. Mm. Yeah, and oh, I just yes. feel like they deserve more. But then I'm like, sound like I'm bitter because I'm like, oh, kids will never understand good music, blah blah. But good music is subjective, and <laughs> everyone is entitled. To art, I art, think I know yeah, the yeah. best music, whereas everyone, everyone you ask, thinks they know the best music. You know, yeah, like, so what's the best music? It's a deep question, actually. It's a deep question. I mean, like, timeless music is good, you know. But you know, like. I don't know if it's because I listened to something the other day. I saw something on on Instagram and I was like, what the fuck is this? What the fuck is this? Because I don't understand it. I was like, I went on YouTube just because I was curious and I was like, clicked and it had like 500 million views or something crazy. And it was, I think, one of the worst songs I've heard in my life. And everyone was like, I, I, this needs to be on Spotify so I can put it on re- repeat. I want this played at my funeral. I was like, oh my, am I that out of touch? Because... I, I, li- I like pop music. I like uh, all types of music. But this music, I just don't understand. And I was, uh, There's a song by J. Cole. Do you know J. Cole? And he, he was talking about all these SoundCloud rappers, like Lil Pump, blah, blah, blah. And um, in one of the lines, he's basically saying, like, because they all got super, super rich. Lil Pump got, like, m- millions and millions and millions. Lil Xan, all this. I only know this because I worked at SoundCloud. I didn't have a clue who these fucking people were. Yeah, just that generation, SoundCloud yeah, rappers. But then they were, they would make this music for, like, two, three years, made fucking, like, hundreds of millions, spent hundreds of millions, and he was telling them, like, you've got 50 minutes of fame here. You, this is not going to last forever. Stop spending it like you do. Something like this. Don't, don't quote me on that. And then they're like, f- they made a song called, like, Fuck J. Cobbler, and now oh, they're all no, broke. No, no. Now all of them are broke, and yeah. he called it exactly. He's like, I kind of told you, you know. It's it's very interesting what you're saying. It's like when I hear your example about J Cole, I think about all the artists we've been growing up, Eminem, Fifty yeah. Cent, these guys that were already like showing up in their clip cars, women, alcohol, clubs, yeah. bling bling, all that stuff. Yeah. But I have the feeling that nowadays the level. Of the the, the the bling bling mm-hmm. increase so yeah. much. Yeah, yeah. The cars, the the yacht, the yachts, yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Like they're, yeah. they're 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 driving or like whatever. Like it's crazy. It took really another dimension. Like just like Dubai, for example. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> That's a good. Uh, it's been glamorized by media and like for however many years now you know so it's like the clicks kids, sell. Th- that's why people want to be rappers not to make good music to have this being being to have these yachts you know mm. as back in the day it used to be like a way out of poverty as opposed to being the richest person yeah. ever you know? like and like i remember this beef with like do you remember machine gun kelly of course and eminem and i i the best part about <laughs> music for me is fucking beefs like grime when i was growing up when a when a diss track came out, you're fucking so excited because that's what makes music good. And recently, Stormzy, I remember he did a track called Wiley Wiley Flow. Oh yeah. Then Wiley got pissed, saying you stole my. And he's like, Stormzy pretty much said it, not pretty much. He explicitly said it was an homage to him, and he got pissed because Stormzy's making more money and blah blah. But then the music that came out of that beef, that beef was amazing. Yeah, but these guys are. Already- authentic i have the feeling yeah, yeah, like yeah. that the, the grime drill like uk scene in general I like is like <laughs> even americans are like copying right now you know yeah yeah, yeah. that's really it's good you know <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then like when you compare that with eminem and machine gun kelly now he does pop rock and yeah. for me that was like okay this is just like a kind of we, we all know who won you know and yeah, then on yeah. the other side then you have like still guys that are staying like in French we say straight in their shoes like and do their stuff yeah. to, to, to keep and they keep on going like they, they have the consistency they, yeah, yeah yeah exactly yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think this is very I respect that a lot mm-hmm. which in the case of uh, Machine Gun Kelly it's like what was I, he famous is he a rapper like what's he do I, I, don't, don't I don't know man I, I don't like him I don't know I, that like <laughs> I discovered him by chance on some free mixtapes 2010 when he was rapping oh, was he over back in 2010 yeah he, 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 yeah, he, oh, he was yeah. rapping over instrumentals or like beats like the ones from the bloody beat with Steve Aoki Warp 1.9 this kind of stuff okay, okay. he was rap, rapping on that or like Terribly other in, or good Honestly, I don't know. I haven't heard this track or like this song for uh, in years. Mm-hmm. And back in the days when I was, uh, yeah, very young. Yeah, <laughs> it, yeah. It was also like this, oh, wow, it's super cool. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. then you see that this guy's like producing a lot, like working. I thought it was his beats. And then like the more you, you hear music, like you learn that, mm, okay, no, he's just song singing on that. Yeah, yeah. 
And like right now to see the evolution, which is also very interesting, no? Yeah. And uh, yeah, right now he's married to uh, to Megan Fox, and he, she was my crush when I was twelve. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> he got my respect. Like, <laughs> I'm not. Well, I, do you watch? I don't know if you watch UFC, but like, there's a guy called Conor McGregor. I don't know if you know this guy. Dude, we, wa- we watch the UFC for Hasbullah. Come on. Oh yeah, exactly. Yeah, I would not want to fight him. Just for the record, if you're watching, please. <laughs> oh no, yeah, yeah. But um. Yeah, they had a fight at some red carpet event. I, I like so I watch a lot of UFC, so yeah. I'm always watching the um, the gossip and stuff because it's more like a soap opera. Have you seen that Dana White wants to find um, what's his name again, Jake Paul? If he switches to Did he, he say changes, this? yeah, he said like if that motherfucker is switching, like changing to UFC, I'm gonna train, I'm gonna beat this motherfucker Fuck, up. Yeah, I would yeah, pay yeah. good money for this. <laughs> I used to hate Jake Paul, actually, but recently I started to warm up to him a little but bit. But man, I think no one likes the Jake, like the Paul brothers, yeah. like after everything they've been doing on the internet. And no judgment. I, I mean, I'm out of all of this, like I've just like seen all this reels, etc. And I understand why people don't like them. I just think it's so But that's sad. what the, it's like. They built, like, I'll tell you who I hate the most is this is already deviating from music, but fucking Andrew Tate. I don't <laughs> wish death upon a lot of people. But I, I, he's done so much bad for yep. male kids that I just, I'm happy if he just didn't, wasn't walking on the earth. Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a, like, that's a polite way to say it, but yeah. No, no, but it's important like to, to, to say but Again, that. it shows what social media can do, you know, like. Especially for young men. Some like young men who feel like they're victims of everything and he's perpetuating that he's like, the women are like objects to be used and he's saying this and this is harmful for the generation of kids where being an incel is very common now you sure. know because most yeah kids I, I don't know what's happening in, in, that, in that scene but like it's just like you read about you know I'll, sometimes I'll go on 4chan or see some excerpts and I'm reading the comments I don't know why I did this to myself <laughs> but I always read the comments in the Andrew Tate thing and I'm expect because I hang around with like-minded people, so I expect people to be pissed. Everyone's like, "Yeah, free Andrew Tate, blah blah." Like, and it just it just pisses me off. I just hate the guy. Well, you don't know who's behind all these comments. This is a sad thing about that. It's yeah, like we we don't know, especially the younger generation has not necessarily the enough experience to understand. Like, hey, we live in 2023, and this can be a problem to think like this, and this should be removed from the internet. Yeah, exactly. You now he's back online. I think. Right. I have but no I, idea, but I just, I just the way I found out about it is by accident. Like the so YouTube algorithm, I was like, it. You know, when you see a car crash and you you, you shouldn't look, but you keep looking. Yeah. This is, yeah, yeah, yeah. and you're like, don't click on the comments. I click on the comments. It's like, I, I do this to myself. You know, like when you've got like a scab and you want to pick it. It's like, you know, you, they hey told man, you if you do to, it, you have problems. Not with this tattoo. <laughs> not with this tattoo. What makes a good resident? Uh, can play any time. Is loyal, I guess. Um, knows what to play at which time. Mm-hmm. Like, when I grew up, going to a warm-up set was fucking amazing. So you can see, you could really grow as the night gets older kind of thing. But I've played in some clubs now where people just start playing 145 BPM, <laughs> which is crazy. Like I played at Revy Sudos and I was super happy with how it went because it was like, I went from ambient music or in Bergheim, for example, like started off with ambient music and went slowly into the, into the heavier stuff because in Bergheim obviously you get like four hours. Sure. So that's for well, me. You have the time huh? to build up. You have yeah. the time to build up. Which is up. also what I've been spoiled living in Berlin because yeah. all the all the set times have been like four hours minimum. Sure. Then I go play in London. It's like you have an hour, an hour and a half. I'm like, what the fuck? Like even in London, it's like so yeah, short. you have like two hour sets. It's like pretty standard. What's the ideal uh, time slot, or like you know, when, uh, how long should a set be? I don't know. Like for me, I feel comfortable. If I play for two hours, I'm like, I could easily play for six more hours, you know? Yeah. Depending on the crowd and your connection with the crowd. I played a gig in Italy and the person before me was playing 155 BPM <laughs> and was playing Justin Timberlake techno edit. And I was like, okay. Justin Timberlake. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. I was already stressing. I was like, fuck, <laughs> it's 155 BPM. And then I'm coming back from the toilet and it's like, I'm bringing sexy back. And I was like, oh, fuck. Like, how am I going to play after this? What do you play after this? You know. And how did you? What did you I just play? played? I stood. I just reset the mood and stuff and played what I wanted because I was like, I'm, I, I, 
even if I had that music, I don't. Yeah. I would never want to play that music. You know. Did it work? Yeah, I reset it, and then maybe I didn't understand the techno stuff, but I started playing some house stuff, and I found a middle okay. ground where I could connect with the crowd. Okay, okay. But yeah, like if you have a resident at a club, they they understand more of the like how to set stuff up for the DJs after you, and to know that your set isn't the ho- isn't the peak of the whole event. You know, you're not the centerpiece here. The it's not even about ego; it's just about like knowing. To make the night better, I need to play this, not to make your set better. So yeah. you're saying, or like what we can say of this is like the lineup is more a team. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, because when you go for a night, you're not just going for one set and going home. You know, of course. If of you're course. watching a podcast or if sure. you're watching a, like a like a live stream, that's different. You know, mm-hmm. because you're at home, you put it on for an hour, you stop. If you're at a club. I, c- I can speak for myself here. I'm going to be there for a long time, you know? Mm. So if someone peaks too early, that ruins my night. Of course. Yeah, yeah it, ha- it happens a lot, I think. Like, yeah. from when we, we, we read online, etc. like, it's a little sad that this thing, like, kind of still happen. Of course, like, we then mostly with uh, DJs that have a little less experience than the older ones. Yeah. I mean, like, it's, it's fine. Shouldn't be, but it's like, it happens. Yeah. How... How do you react like when this happens to you? Like, explain about the situation, but like in general, like did it happen like a lot? Like as a as a guest, it yeah. pisses me off because I'm like, I love hard music, I love all this stuff, but like there's yeah. a time and place for everything, you know. Mm-hmm. I'll be just as pissed if the peak time plays and played ambient. So what what, hours, you know? what pisses you off? That the DJ is playing too fast and too hard, like too fast. There's nothing too wrong hard? with too fast and too hard, oh. but there's a time and a place, you know. Okay, okay. okay. It's just. To set the mood, like, because imagine if you listen to just 24 hours of just gab, uh, like 24, like 155 BPM, where the mood is just like this. Thunderdome, baby. Imagine if you watch the film, for example, and it's just a two hour action scene. You, it, you don't appreciate the action scene, you know? And you need to have a story to. Did you just say you don't like Transformers? I love transfer. Oh, <laughs> Michael, <laughs> sorry, Michael. <Bay. laughs> no, but you know what I mean? Like you need to have peaks and lows and stuff. And as yeah. a warm-up DJ, whether you like it or not, you should invite guests onto the floor gradually and have be mindful of who's playing afterwards. And mm. yeah. But this is personal. Right? There might be someone who likes to just go and listen to yeah, sure. fast music for 24 hours. I, I get your point. I got so like do to share this and um I think like there's also, especially in Berlin, where like the parties are very long, it might be complicated to make everyone happy because like there's people that are staying just like for one set and then go home and then come yeah. back or they stay for like 8, 12, 16, 24 or more hours. Yeah. So of course, like when you when you have all these time slots overlapping and shot and have people coming and mm-hmm. going, you will ever always have someone that's not happy or yeah. on the other side, people that are always but happy. Y- you like. have more freedom when you've got like a four hour set, you know, if sure. you do take it up, you can bring it back down. You have freedom to move around. Yeah. And you have, there's going to be a coherency in the cohesion in the, in the set still. Mm-hmm. But sometimes I'll go, the, the, the biggest turnoff is going to a club where there's no one on the dance floor and there's just pounding dance music, you know, sure. which th- if you played that at a different time, I would love it. You know, it's just, it's not a time and a place. For me, okay, okay, okay. Speaking for myself here. Yeah. Do you talk to the other DJs from the lineup when you when you play? No, no. But I would like most of the time I know what their style of music is or whatever. But if someone's booking me for the same night, we should have a similar thread taking like holding us together. You know, that's the job of the booker. It's the job of the yeah, the logistics of the night. You know. Uh Yeah, it's it's interesting. Like when you see also lineups where DJs do not necessarily have something like their style do not necessarily match. Yeah. To see in what direction this can go, and like sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, I remember I was at a festival where I saw Jeff Mills and he fucking tore the place down in an amazing way. And the person playing after him was playing One Twenty Six Tech House. And I felt bad for them because Oof. it was like it's not their fault. It's the it's the promoter's fault in my opinion. Yeah. But like. It was a very mismatched lineup. But was it was it a tech house DJ or did that yeah. person? Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, well, yeah, yeah. But this 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 tent was for like the the the, the headliners, let's say, or like the mm. people bring in the most people. But like, if you'd listen to that Jeff Mills set and then go into one twenty six tech house, you're going to be shocked. Basically, oh, you were. 
I was shocked. Like, yeah. I left. <laughs> I never <laughs> I went left. back. <laughs> yeah. And what would you look like? Like, what what's you want to be in 10 years? What's your I don't future? Know. I want to be... So the reason I make music is like, I don't know. I want to be proud of it. What I'm making forever. Mm-hmm. Not just at the time, you know? So like... I want to have a piece of work where I can look back and be proud of and it's going to stand the test of time, which is, I'm assuming, which a lot of producers do. But there's some tracks for me which I'll listen to every day and I'll never get bored of, you know? And mm-hmm. I want to get to that stage where I've got a body of work which I'm proud of. It doesn't have to be techno or whatever. It's just something I'm proud of and want to be remembered for longer, let's say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How do you get feedback? I send it to a lot of friends. I've got some trusted friends who I send stuff to. Yep. And I try not to send it to English people because they're too nice. Um, <laughs> no, I'm joking. What I now send is like, okay, if people say it's good, I'll be like, if you could change one thing, what, what would, would you change? Be, yeah. What's your least favourite track in this? What's and your why, least okay. favourite element? Like, It's not nice to hear. I used to like sending it to people who would be nice, but now I'm like, you don't get better like this. And Sure. Yeah. So who do you send it to? My friend UVB, my friend Connor, Lee, the trusted people who I always send stuff to. And UVB specifically is very brutally honest, but he's done it in a very uh, constructive way. That's what it's me, about. Which is exactly right? what I want, you know? It's like a cheat code. Because yeah. so I was saying, if I could invent any drug, it will be a drug where I can take it and I will listen to the track like I've never heard it before. Because once you make something for so long, you have so much emotional attachment to it and you think it's the best thing ever. But if you listen to it in a year you'd think differently. But because you put all these small details in, you g- give it more of a gravity than mm-hmm. it maybe should do. So it'd be good to take a drug where I'm like, listen to it like someone else has made it, you know, and have no emotional attachment Interesting. to it. Yeah. Interesting. And do you only send it to people who produce music or who play? No, or no, no, no. Okay. I've sent stuff to my mum. My girlfriend's a good critic as well. Yeah. Yeah. Mum as well? Yeah, but like I don't send her. The th- I send her more of like the classical pieces. Okay, okay. But she's she, yeah, yeah. She, she, she comes like with proper she feedback, it. huh? She comes like with proper feedback. Yeah, she has done before. Yeah, yeah. okay, nice. Yeah, yeah. She's also in the scene. Yeah, yeah, she's big in the scene. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like it's important to have people you can send stuff to because Absolutely. when I first started making music, I thought this. I, I this year I know everything I'm ever going to know, and since then mm. I've not that I know nothing. Then, and every year I say. I know so much and then I always surprise myself with how much more I can learn, you know? Mm-hmm. And that comes from having a good close circle of friends for me anyway because uh, I can send them and ask them for objective, like nothing personal, just tell me how it is, you know? Mm. So I feel like if it's if I send it to someone else, they might be polite or something like this and you know, cool. they might sugarcoat it. Yeah, no, sure. And how, how often do you do it? Do you do it? You do, you do you send it over when you feel, okay, I'm stuck here? I would send it over when it's like 95% done, where I know like 5% is like just adding small details, which yeah. wouldn't change the bigger picture. Uh, well, sometimes small details can change the bigger picture, but that's a different story. But like I know where a track is basically done. And what I love about UVB is that he's really good at arrangements and he always helps me. Mm. And when I'm making music, I sometimes get distracted, not distracted, but like, overly explorative and I'd be like okay when the drop happens this needs to happen this needs to happen and what I would another thing is what I tell myself is that less is more it sounds like a cliche but um, stripping stuff down is actually harder than adding more stuff in and stripping stuff down and keeping it relevant and interesting is harder than adding more stuff can you apply this theory Uh, I know exactly what you mean like I yeah. also do struggle with this Yeah, it's more like I tell myself this but I can't like some basic example with the sketch it's like hey that's cool but I'm not happy yet so I just like procrastinate Yeah, yeah. yeah. and I see it but like mm, no I don't know I scroll a little bit through my inspiration I don't know anything I don't see anything mm-hmm. and then it's like oh wait but then I see during this inspiration thing I see like three other things I set a new flash and then I have boom almost like one flash or a new one Yeah, and then continue so how is it for you? So, like, my biggest enemy, let's say, was, like, finishing a track, starting off a good idea, and by the time I finished it, I've got four different songs in one song, you know? Mm -hmm. And when new producers send stuff to me to listen to, 
yeah, everyone makes the same mistake. And I, yeah. this is something I would tell myself when I was growing up, because it's like it, limit, limiting yourself is actually a good trait to have when it comes to music. You know, like if composers can make a five minute, I don't know, like a piano track with just one instrument, like eight, eight tracks with eight different elements should be mm -hmm. easy. You know? And some of my favorite stuff is just like a loop where maybe four, five, six, seven, eight, different tracks are playing but research then yeah exactly right. oh, okay 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 yeah like yeah, so do all less but better mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. interesting and how is it to to live like your hobby let's call it like this even if i don't really like the word yeah like or how how is music what, what kind of space does music have in your life it's like i'm always always, always doing something with music, whether it's writing something on my phone. I have a notebook where I write down ideas because when I write, write it with my hand, it sticks in my head. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I've got a note, it gets lost in like a shopping list or something like this. I forget about what it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And like we were talking about earlier, like um, sometimes you write stuff down very quickly yeah. and you forget what it fucking means. And you literally, yeah. yeah, yeah. And sometimes I've, I've written out such complex things which make no sense to me anymore. But that's yeah, interesting. That, yeah. that maybe that can help back in a few months or weeks. It just comes it, back. Like when, when you feel like I, I, I know that it's also like for my sketchbook. Like I draw like quick things, and um, sometimes when I see another I, cool idea, then it's like, oh wait a second, I had this on my sketchbook. Yeah. And then you mix it differently, and then something cool comes out of exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And like that's like remixing yourself, like you said, you know. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's always good to. What I've learned is that as a producer myself, I, I, I forget a lot of things and some techniques which I maybe use as a kid, not as a kid, as when I was younger, like I've probably forgotten because I didn't write it down. Mm -hmm. And you get comfortable not thinking you're never going to forget it. And then sometimes I listen to a track, I'm like, how did I do that? I should have written it down. Mm -hmm. And I started making like a little book of every tiny detail, but that becomes tedious and like laborsome sometimes. Yeah. But... It's definitely worth doing. And if you, you, everyone gets writer's block, or like creative like slumps, you know? Do you sometimes lose yourself in these notes? No. No. Because I always try and do it when I'm not doing something else. So it kind of... It's not like I'm not doing it to procrastinate. I'm doing it, okay, I need to write this, and when it's done, it's done. And I don't use it every time I'm making music. Sometimes if I'm, for example... I don't know what how to start a track. I'm like, okay, this one says get a groove going by starting with these elements, blah, blah, blah. Or like sometimes I'll listen to music, which is some random music, and I'll get inspired. Or even what I started doing recently was like for arrangements of a song, I was actually trying to break down films and how they start. Mm -hmm. Because they don't start with the drop. They don't start with the reveal at the beginning. They start very slowly sometimes, or mm -hmm. they might start fast, but then they go down... And just to see the different like peaks and troughs and stuff, mm -hmm. and use that to maybe make a own my own arrangement and stuff. Do you have any other ideas that you are kind of stuck on, and like how you then you ask yourself like how can I move forward on that? So like like I said like if I'm when I'm making music I like I try not to get if I get stuck uh -huh. I have multiple projects mm -hmm. so I'd have like four or five that I'm working on. Preferably not similar tracks, but um, I think you can even get some sort of add-on which tells you. So you get 15 minutes, mm -hmm. and when the 15 minutes is up, it, I think it closes Ableton, so you have to start a new project. Mm. And my friend who's a mastering engineer, uh, what he says is like, so when he's mastering tracks, he'll have like, you know, 10 tracks. He'll listen to 10 seconds, 10 seconds, because when you're mastering, you don't you don't listen to the, to the, the music, whole, you have yeah. to listen to the sounds, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That sounds weird, but like, you have to listen to the balance of the track without any emotional attachment to this, you know? So what he does is listen to five seconds. Because when you listen to a track, you get absorbed by the lyrics, the, the feeling of the chords and stuff like this. You don't want that. You want to just look at it objectively. It's a pure technical aspect. Purely technical, no emotion there at all. You just want to get it to a standard where everything is balanced. Mm, okay. And when I'm making music, sometimes if I'm making something over, like listen to something over and over again, the emotions take over and the technicality leaves, mm. you know? Which is why, like I said, it would be good to list, take a drug where I can listen to it like I've never listened to it before. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Um, 
but yeah, work for me working on multiple projects. For some, like a lot of people say, I like, go for a walk and stuff, which also helps me. Um, but if you're on a time constraint, you can't really do this. But uh, what is a bad thing and a good thing is like, so I always think I can buy my way into creativity. So what's missing is this VST, this synth. And you, you'll soon realise you're going to be broke and you're going to have no ideas because each, each synth you buy, you're like, okay, this is going to change my life. And it does change your life a little bit, but you should not get caught in the trap of just keep buying new shit even though I'm doing that right now as we speak. So you're <laughs> investing, like to invest in new tools, doesn't matter yet now if it's a program or a synth or yeah. an instrument or a brush or a pen or whatever. Yeah. How do you deal with that? Like how, when you when you get new gear, like you immediately work with it, you integrate it to I all, use it all production? For how everything I can possibly use it for. I'm obsessed with it, you know? And for example, like the time where I was most prolific in making tracks quickly was when I first started making music I kn I didn't know what a plugin was mm -hmm. and I just used the stuff that was contained within Ableton and I made so much music mm -hmm. so much music because I knew everything and I didn't have to spend time researching stuff or having trial and error because I've already done trial and error from the first 50 times I made music I know everything like it's the back of my hand you know mm -hmm. but then you watch a review, you speak to a friend, you listen to uh, someone you admire and they mention something, you're like, well, if it works for them, why doesn't it work for me, you know? Oh, so you cool. buy something new and then you're like, okay, if I buy this, then I need to buy this and you keep going down this rabbit hole. It's nice to have plugins. It is nice and there's mm -hmm. some plug. You can do, you can make a studio quality top, top 10 pop track, the most polished, beautiful piece of music, beautiful being like, you know, ready for car radios, people are willing to invest hundreds of millions into this with just Ableton stuff, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. you, can, you can emulate basically anything with Ableton, but it's just going to take more time. And sometimes, like I was saying, with, with minimalism, in, when it comes to elements of a track, it's also nice to be minimal with the effects you use as well. I was watching a, a, a podcast with John Hopkins, Mm -hmm. John Hopkins and FKJ, who I'm a big fan of, probably one of the best best live acts I've seen in my life, and I kind of hate him for this in a good way. And I was watching how he made music, and I was expecting like this massive studio. I was like, no, I've just got a fucking laptop and a few few plugins. I was like, okay, it's really inspiring. And there's also uh, a series on YouTube called Rhythm Roulette, mm -hmm. and the premises of this is. Um, you take a producer, it's, it's mainly hip hop. They go to a, like their local record store with a blindfold. They have to pick out five records, take it home and make a new track with this. Cool, it's a uh, and concept. Yeah, it's really nice. And 99% of the people make a banger out of this shit. Nice. And when I see their equipment, they're like, it will say the accolades, like produce for, I don't know, Kanye West, produce for Drake, blah, blah. And you see their studio and it's just a guy with a shitty little like speakers and... Use, he, this guy made a track with just the keyboard of the of, of his MacBook, mm -hmm, you know. Mm -hmm. So it shows you don't need fancy stuff. And every time, uh, like you know, someone famous does an interview, they always sit in this crazy studio. But I've seen people make better music in shitter studios, you know. And it's about learning your tools very well, as opposed to having a lot of tools you don't know very well. Yeah, interesting. But it is addictive, I'd say. And I I've fallen into that trap as well myself. Yeah. Like I watch a YouTube review and within 10 seconds I've spent 100 euros on something I've used once, you know. <laughs> but you like it is nice sometimes to have something new, to, like like you change a studio, it's nice to change what you use in the studio mm -hmm. as well. I've got friends who, you know, rotate synths around, so some they'll hide and when they're finished with this synth, they're like, okay, let's get another synth out and it looks kind of new to them because I haven't used it in such a long time, you know. We've talked about a lot of about your inspiration and like the feedback, but especially with this gear, do you exchange with friends who yeah. also produce? Okay. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay. For sure. Like every time I'm bored of something, UVB again <laughs> has been a savior. When I was sick, he, he brought me over his DFAM. Just if I ever need a synth, he's always there. He's got his studio is very, I'm very jealous of it. Yeah. Yeah. So UVB, maybe you're next. My next what? Sitting here. He's going to be here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would be nice. Yeah. I, I relate a lot to what you're saying. Uh, I do have the struggle, what's called struggle, but 
we have a digital era mm-hmm. and I reduce my consume of inspiration, Instagram, whatever, Pinterest, Behance, all their websites, whatever they all are, to books. Mm-hmm. Like when I see an artist, I buy a book mm-hmm. from them. Like it doesn't matter, share it in Graham. No, Shepard Fairy, not the Stingray. Uh, the Aubrey guy, whatever, like Al Musha, Musha, all the all the different painters. Yeah. Like you have different inspirations, then you study. Yeah. What do they do? How do they do? Etc. And then you see, then you also understand where the inspiration from other artists comes from. Yeah. This is one thing. It's like, hey, if you want to do or like copy, uh, or like if you want to be good, you copy other artists because like at the end, I just become good by copying, which is like. Not totally true. Mm-hmm. You gotta copy or like imitate their inspiration. Yeah, exactly. How do you see this? Yeah, it's also like the thing is, if you copy an artist, you're never gonna be the same as them, mm-hmm. and that could be good or bad. You know, I agree. if you're trying to make the same music as them, they got more experience, and nine times out of ten, there are some anomalies in this. But like sure. nine times out of ten, you're not gonna be as good as them, and you should never try to be as good as them. You should be, you should you're, do your own thing. You know, yeah. use them as inspiration. When I f- like when you first start making music, try to copy someone. That's a great way. That's a great exercise to do it. But by doing this, you're going to naturally find your own what works for you from this artist's flow. And maybe you might copy something from someone else. You're going to copy two people. Then you're going to copy three people. And by the end, you're going to have your own sound. Mm-hmm. You know. And I've got nothing like art for me. Any form of art will be nothing without copying. Nothing zero. You know, like if you put a kid who's never touched human like society in a room with a piano by so I'll be interested to hear what, what would come out if you left the kid in there for <laughs> for forty years. Mm-hmm. Maybe they're gonna but it wouldn't be as conventional as what we'd hear now. But like every artist is a byproduct of their influences, whether it's food, films Whatever what was seen consume every day exactly mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. and maybe if you live in a country where it's cold all the time your music's gonna be different to the, if it's somewhere the vibe. on the beach mm-hmm. whatever like. absolutely yeah. yeah we can f- we, we can feel that also uh we had uh, Paula Koski a few weeks ago and she was explaining the whole uh, so she's from Finland and she okay. was explaining this whole uh Scandinavian northern sound which yeah. is like more like Cold, cold is not necessarily the right adjective, yeah. but more like kind of minimalistic. I l- like some of my favorite music comes from the Nordic countries. Yeah, like some of my favorite music. When you see, also it depends like the, on the context that you're listening to it. For example, if it's uh, it's uh, ah very bad weather outside, and you're like, or it's the night or whatever, and you you play it, it gives that whole other dimension sure. than if you're in the summer where it's like absolutely no sense to listen to that music exactly yeah yeah it's super interesting because like I remember in, in England I'll be coming back it's raining you listen to burial and it just fits mm-hmm. you know it's built for England basically you know? yeah what do you what is like typical British music for you like what what resonates with you right now in terms of electronic music or like what, what, when I say like what do you see can be drill can be grime can be Elton John I don't care grime what is always going to be English for me yeah like, Whoever copies it is always going to sound English to me. Whereas techno that's come out of England has been used, like Birmingham sound, my favorite type of techno, and it's been you can see it coming from loads of different countries and it, it's, it's evolved. But grime for me is just because I started listening to it when I was like 12, 13, mm-hmm. and having it on a CD, Dizzy Rascal, whatever, and like it's a sound for me, it's like the sound of the streets without it sounding cheesy, you know? Like, oh, it is, it is. Yeah. And when I hear these this kick pattern, these bass lines, these square bass lines, it reminds me of, of like council flats <laughs> where all this stuff started. Like I, I can smell the air when I hear this music. So that's what defines it for me, you know? Mm-hmm. Like it takes me back somewhere. Yeah, I really like the, the, the fact that you can associate a type of music to a vibe, especially when you've been to that place. Yeah. And that reminds you also, like from the feeling, from smells, from the weather, from yeah, temperature, yeah, exactly, whatever. Yeah. Like you go back, if you close your eyes, you're back to that situation. It's yeah. amazing that we're able as humans like to feel this kind of thing. Yeah, for sure. And sometimes, sometimes you listen to music and it takes you to a place you've never been before. Mm-hmm. Like there's this, I think he's Dutch pianist called Joop Beving, who I was discovered recently, and it's just like you listen and you're like, it takes you somewhere you don't know where. Emotionally and physically, it takes you somewhere. Yeah. And every time I, pl- I play at home all the time, and everyone always asks, What is this music? It's really nice, you know? Mm-hmm. 
And any oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Any other artists like you have in mind right now? I can't think. I mean, everyone knows me. Knows that I love Grouper. Like she's like a f- ambient folk singer mm-hmm. kind of thing, and she's been. Like, if I could make music like anyone, it would be her. Yeah? I would copy her and I'll be happy. Like, if I get to that stage. Did you try? Huh? Did you try? It involves a lot of singing. And she, like, ever since I heard her for the first time, I listened to her, like, I listened to her album every day for, like, three years. Yeah. I got goosebumps every, and I listen to it when I wake up, when I sleep, when I'm happy, I'm sad, whatever. When it's raining, when it's sunny, listen to it, and it always takes me to, like, a really good place. It's beautiful to have that kind of musical relationship to yeah. uh, to an artist. I think it's very honorable also like for the person who produced it. Yeah, I've got so much admiration because she has zero social media, zero, nothing. You can't find shit. I've been like scouring the internet for like interviews and stuff and she's just, I saw her live luckily in, in by Halish's tour somewhere in this like old abandoned like church or something. And her presence is just crazy. She doesn't need to jump. She doesn't need to do anything. She came on, played the piano, played her guitar, sang. When she's finished, she put the thing down and just walked off. And we're like, is she finished now? Whatever, yeah. Is she finished now? She didn't, like, that's it. And then we're like, clap? Do we clap now? And for me, I love this attitude of, like, she's very, very introverted. And there's also a guy called Keaton Henson. He sings, like, folk music. If you listen to it, you'll, you'll probably want to, like, kill yourself. <laughs> it's, like, it's very, like, it's very depressing, but I love it. And it's the same, like, people always ask me why I listen to depressing music and watch depressing films, and I always say, like, it's not because I'm depressed, but when I watch these things, it pre- make me, makes me appreciate my life more, you know? So when I watch something depressing, I'm like, okay, my life could be worse. Sure. It's not because I'm depressed, you know? Fucking emo. Yeah, exactly. No, but I'm the opposite. <laughs> I'm the opposite. Like, my li- I, I'm complaining because, like, my AirPods ran out of battery and yeah. someone's dying in this film, you know? So it's like, <laughs> it could be worse. It's like, no. <laughs> yeah. Back to the cables. But yeah, like I would love to get to this level where it's like the music speaks for itself. You know? With Grouper, it does. All of her projects are fucking amazing. And yeah, to see someone be so successful and define, like for me, it's the most personal music I've listened to. And I, if I could speak to her, I would tell her like, your music puts me to sleep. And for me, that's the biggest compliment because it's like, Sleep is such a personal thing. Yeah. And I have issues with sleeping. So for someone to put me to sleep, that's the best thing I can tell someone, you know? But yeah, it's like every time I listen, I get the same feeling. It's like I could listen to it over and over again and repeat and I wouldn't change anything about it, you know? That's cool. Yeah. It's beautiful. Thanks for the wise words. Yeah. Jenna, it was amazing to have you here. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. Got through a lot of stuff today. See you later, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.